Hello and welcome to the Creative Tech Show. My name is Chris Murray and welcome to the show tonight. Tonight we are going to be looking at cloud-based tools for artists. And um, we're gonna be taking a look at a couple of things that I use quite a bit, but I'm also interested in hearing from you all out in the audience to contribute to the conversation and to see you know, uh, what kind of tools you're using, what, ty what type of tools are enforcing your work or helping you um, accomplish your goals creatively. The mantra for this show is kind of uh, where the uh, inner, your inner artist meets your inner geek. So uh, any and all tools are on the table. I certainly don't know them all. And I'm interested in hearing and learning. Half the reason I do uh, this type of show is because I learn from you as well. So sit back, relax, get something to drink, and let's go ahead and just start jumping in a little bit and um, learn about uh, artist uh, cloud-based tools for artists. So the cloud brings several new ways of doing things. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that the cloud affords. A lot of people, you know, think of the cloud as, you know, this this mysterious thing that's, you know, off uh, in the ether and um, doesn't really, um, uh, you know, they don't really understand how it how it affects their business or, or what, what they can do with it. Maybe they're using the cloud on some kind of, you know, ambiguous project or it, it floats out there. Um, maybe you're at a big enough company where you can actually have an internal cloud right, where all of your stuff is basically a centralized server. The cloud has really evolved from being this centralized piece of data in your com in your company or maybe a network attached, attached storage device in your house to being this ubiquitous hard drive that seemingly has uh, no end to uh, the storage space on there. So we're going to be looking uh, tonight at how the cloud is enabling creatives to accomplish their work. So some of the things that the cloud really brings is a new series of options, things that we didn't have before. I know that, you know, when I was uh, starting in this business, I had really, um, uh, I didn't really have the ability to take my work with me wherever I went. I was always working on a thumb drive or heaven forbid, a floppy drive, even burning CD-ROMs, those sorts of things. And so the cloud has really enabled artists to, uh, and all, all content creators to, to really have access to a much greater depth of uh, resources, not just where they're keeping their files or where they're working, but how they're working and how they are manipulating or um, uh, creating their content. Um, I see uh, Kim has joined. Thanks for joining, Kim. Feel free to uh, uh, contribute there um, uh, in the chat. So, what types of challenges has uh, uh, the cloud brought you? I know that um, you know a lot of times I'm working on multiple machines and I'm I'm saving my work to Dropbox. Dropbox is a frequent type of tool that I use. Um, we'll be talking about a little bit about that tonight. Um, you know, having everything synced on all of my machines is really an amazing way to work because I have everything with me almost wherever I go. If I'm on, if if I'm working at my workstation and I need to grab my laptop, I, 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 I know that I have pretty much all of my stuff there. If um, I'm working remotely uh, at, uh, at one of our satellite offices or maybe at a client, maybe you're working at a client, you can sync up and you can always have your stuff with you. And the cost for these, for these cloud type of tools I'm finding is the sweet spot between, you know, 10 and $20 a month, which, you know, it seems pretty easy to kind of for these companies to try and separate people from their money that way a little bit, um, but it really starts to add up, you know. So I, I find myself being more and more selective with the tools uh, with the tools that I uh, am using. One of the things that I really like about the cloud is that it enables collaboration. There's a number of different types of collaborative tools out there that are uh, that can be used uh, among teams, among individuals. Um, you know, when I'm when I'm collaborating with my teams, you know, where I work during my day job, I'm able to uh, provide content to them as if they were sitting, you know, in the cube next to me. Uh, they can they can look at whatever it is that I'm working on. I can look at whatever it is that they're working on. It's really an interconnected workflow. And we realize that we don't need to be uh, in the same office all the time to do it. Uh, some of the other things that I really like about collaboration is not just sharing of the imagery and stuff that we create, but it's actually um, 
sharing the creative process. And I don't mean art direction or, you know, uh, voice direction or, you know, um, kind of, you know, creative input on various parts of the task, which of course that happens. That's a natural part of doing it. But being part of the pre-production process, there's some cloud tools out there that we're going to take a look at that um, are, uh, we're, you know, we're able to um, uh, do lots of different things and uh, you can embed media in some of these things. You can go and grab uh, grab different types of graphics or images or inspiration things. And, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that tonight. Um, the cloud enables mobility, right? And I've already, I've been talking about um, how we're interconnected in terms of I can work with, you know, I have, uh, I have colleagues that I work with in Montreal. I have colleagues that I work with in San Francisco, New York, and I'm in the mountains of North Carolina. So we, you know, sharing individually like that is easy, but what about being on the go? And I had alluded to the fact that I do do some traveling um, in my role as a technical evangelist. So I'm able to have all of my tools with me um, at any given time. So um, I'm glad to see we have some people in the room tonight. Feel free to uh, hop in. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on some of the things that we're talking about. Don't be shy. Um, again, we're talking about um, cloud-based tools for artists. And we're, these can be tools that we're actually creating content with. These can be tools that we're using to enable our work. These can be tools that uh, um, uh, support our work. Uh, you know, maybe it's code, maybe you know, it's text or graphics. What I call a very narrow slice of the creative of the creative puzzle. Um, I was talking uh, in, in a blab the other day with my friends at um, Future Media Association. We were talking about how all of these tools are solving individual problems, right? And so as one of the challenges as, as creative technologists or creative artists or digital artists is that we need to be able, there's a certain sense of fearlessness that we have to have in our uh, use of these tools. Many of us, uh, maybe you've grown up on a specific tool. Maybe you grew up on Photoshop, maybe you grew up on 3ds Max, maybe you grew up on Illustrator or Flash or whatever. And all of a sudden there's these bevies of tools. You know, I'm finding, um, you know, there were certain tools that I used a lot in my industry uh, previously that were like regular staples of things that I had to do. And then as my career meandered a little bit, I didn't really have to do those tasks anymore, but I still kind of had this knowledge in my head about what it was that I needed to do. And then as, as little as, you know, last week or something, I, you know, I discovered I needed to go back and... Um, go back into this one tool that I hadn't used in a really long time. And it had evolved to the point where I was like, wow, this is ridiculous. I don't know this tool at all. But then I was able to find a cloud-based solution that did everything I needed to do. It just ne did the slice of what I needed. And it was really, uh, it was easier to pick up the cloud tool than it was to actually go back and relearn the new features of the other stuff. So I just want to give some shout outs to some friends here. We have, um, uh, Russ is in the house. Hey, Russ, glad to see you. Um, Stacy Flowers, welcome to the show. Glad to see you're here. Uh, Queen Ninja Guru. Um, uh, not sure what that comment is, but I, I, it's pretty good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna star it. Uh, and uh, we brought friends with us. All right, Russ. All right, uh, friends bearing gifts. I'm totally down with that. And the gift of your presence is good enough for me. So, um, yeah, cloud-based solutions are 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 really great. Um, I see. Um, Thought I saw someone, uh, John Thomas is here. Great to see you, John. Uh, RJ uh, Redden, Sean, um, that's uh, great. Um, I know I know a Sean. I don't know if that's the same Sean that I know, but if it is, welcome. If it isn't, welcome either way. So we're talking about cloud-based solutions for, for artists tonight. And um, we briefly covered the fact that cloud brings a challenge of options, right? There's so many options. And like the story I was just alluding to is I had this old tool, I hadn't used it in a while. I needed to go back and learn something new. And it was very frustrating. And I really just found the sliver of capability that I needed on a cloud tool. So I was um, I was able to abandon the, this longtime tool. And, um, uh, you know, the cloud enables mobility. You know, we are um, moving around so much and we're working out of coffee shops and I'm working out of my home studio and people are working on the go. Um, having all of our tools with us there 
um, it's uh, it can be interesting. You know, it's a, it's an interesting challenge. Um, so I go ahead. I went ahead and opened the seat there. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to use the slash question, the slash Q command uh, to put your questions into the queue so that I can see them easily. Um, that'll be really great. Um, one thing I, I do like about the cloud, and, and I'd be interested to hear what, what you all think about this, is that the cloud does enable consistency. Um, one of the things that I'm starting to discover a little bit is that some of the uh, bigger tools, I'm going to call them the brand name tools, but I'm not going to necessarily mention them here, is that um, cloud-based tools give you allow you the opportunity to have a, a consistent work experience based on where you are if you're not at the same machine. I've noticed this with some of the Adobe products, the Adobe Sync. So I can be working, um, you know, in a computer in the next room or in the next country, or you know, my laptop or any various types of uh, any various types of my devices, and I have the same experience, or not so much the same experience, but I have a lot of the assets that I reuse. Some of my color palettes are still present wherever I go. It's all tied to the cloud. So, you know, those are some things that uh, I really I really like about the cloud. Welcome, uh, George. Welcome, uh, Gord. Glad you're here. Um, I've opened up the seat if anybody wants to jump in and uh, join the conversation. We're talking about cloud-based tools for artists. I'd also ask if you have any questions, please use the slash Q command so that it shows up in the question queue. And I'll be happy to uh, check those out and, and we can address them as a group. So I'd, uh, really appreciate you doing that. Um, and, uh, any, where are we all from tonight? I, uh, I've mentioned where I'm at. I'm in the mountains of North Carolina. Uh, I'd love to hear where some of, uh, you all are from. I think it's kind of interesting that, um, all right, we have Houston, Texas there, of course, great state of Texas. Um, uh, Omaha, Nebraska. All right. Gun Barrel City, Texas. Right on. I don't think I've ever heard of a town named Gum Barrel City. All right, Houston. Okay, Omaha. All right, so we're, we've got some people rolling in from all around. So uh, again, we're talking about cloud-based uh, tools for artists. And uh, we can talk about anything, really. Um, one of the things that um, I find, I, I, of all the things that I really like about the cloud, there are some things that I am dubious about. Right. And I run into this. I, I see this in my own work and I see this in the work of um, some of the customers of the company that I work for. And those are the typical questions around security. Is your data really safe in the cloud? Right. I mean, if you're an, if you're an artist and you're, you're a creative person and you're working for your, you know, yourself, maybe you have a really big contract or a contract of any size, really. And or you're working, you know, for a Fortune 500. Are you going to put your creative assets in a domain that's not within the doors of your building? How do you feel about that? Is that a concern to you? Is that you know? Do you think uh, you think your um, uh, here we should stream <laughs> right on? Um, do you, do you think that is that is an issue anymore? I mean, we do all of our banking in the cloud, but I run into people all the time. Uh, in the industries that uh, I associate with, that they're like, we're not putting our data up on the cloud. We don't know who can see it. But yet they do all their banking on the cloud. All of the banking is on the cloud. Exactly. How is it different than a credit card, Russ? Exactly. It's not It's not that different. And um, now there are some, you know, there are some instances where I could see that, you know, maybe creative artists don't want to put certain things on the cloud. You know, military simulation people, those are artists. Those, those are artists. They're creating digital content. They might, you know, those companies might not want those uh, um, digital assets outside of their control. You know, control is kind of a relative thing, right? Uh, hey, Chase, welcome to the show. Um, yeah, they're afraid. They they worry. They worry it'll be lost. They worry that someone else will view it. Um, you know, they worry that uh, someone who well, someone will gain access that shouldn't have access. But yet, all of their financial data is up on the cloud. Um, you know, the other thing that's kind of an interesting problem, and I'm dealing with this, I'd love to hear some solutions on that is, um, versioning. What, uh, are the issues around, uh, collaborative working on the cloud and, and version control as digital artists, you know, depending on the size of the, of the company you're in, 
um, you, you might be working with a team of, you know, five, 10, 20 people. You might be working on a certain set of pixels, but maybe someone else needs is working on a on a different set of pixels in the same image or the same scene. You know, I'm I, I associate with 3D graphics, so these are big productions with lots of different assets, and you have different artists doing different disciplines, and so version control is a big deal over the cloud, right? And you want to make sure that you're not overwriting other people's work. You want to make sure that no one's overwriting your work. So, um, uh. It uh, you know it can be it can be a challenge at times to make sure that you're all working on uh, the right the right thing. The other thing that I'm uh, curious about, and I alluded to this uh, earlier in the in the first part of the show, um, one of the questions that I think the cloud raises quite a bit is uh, is fees and expenses. Um, I've I've noticed this sweet spot of cloud tools being around the ten to twenty dollar range. If they're providing a niche service, it can be you know twenty nine to forty. How do you feel about the pricing of where everything is at? You know, there was a lot of uh, hemming and hawing when Adobe went to their rental model, and everybody complained, "Oh, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna stay on CS six, and I'm not gonna do any of this other stuff, and you know, they're not gonna, they've already got all the money they're gonna get from me." Is our our cloud tools worth it? Would you rather have a, 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 a you know a one-off license, a perpetual license that is quote unquote yours, and you can get it all the time, or um, you can uh, would you rather just pay as you go, right? So um, yeah, IT knows these things. Uh, oh, so there's a question there. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Future Media says I like ten dollars a month. It feels good. I also pay fifteen dollars for Zoom, and that feels right too. All right, and then Stacy asks, "What's the difference between iCloud and Dropbox?" Um, you know, I don't use iCloud because I use Dropbox. Um, I'm a, I'm going to generally assume it's it's probably the same. I'm I'm also going to assume that iCloud has some more integration into the Apple ecosystem than um, Dropbox. You know, uh, Dropbox is probably one of my absolute uh, favorite um, cloud tools. I use it every day. Um, I never really uh, realized how much I depended on on Dropbox for my daily work, and uh, it's um, it's really changed. You know, it's for me, it's changed the way I it's changed the way I work. Um, one is owned by Apple, and the other is not. Okay, yeah, there you go. There's there's a good answer to that. Welcome, Ultimate Upcyclers. Uh, hey, Sherry, thanks for stopping by. Evan, welcome to the show. Again, if you guys have questions. Please use the uh, slash Q command before your question to get it into the question queue, and um, we can bring it to the forefront of the group. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm glad to see all the uh, chatting going on there. Uh, hey, SEO Chase. Oh, I guess that's Chase Rainier. All right, welcome. Um, the biggest security risk, uh, Russ says, is uh, password on Post-it note attached to your monitor. <laughs> yeah. Especially in the days of Blab, when I have all these monitors behind me, and maybe all my passwords are, are there. That's uh, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, security. You know, uh, security is a big issue. I'd be curious, and I, I don't necessarily want the specifics, but if anybody in the audience has ever had their cloud tools hacked, and I'm not talking about Gmail or Yahoo Mail or email. I mean, that scaringly happens happens a lot. But I'd be interested to know if anybody has actually had any of their cloud tools hacked. I have never heard of that happening at all. So um, uh, you're welcome, Russ. I'm I'm glad you're here. So uh, you know, I, I've uh, just going on anecdotal information. If anybody has ever had that, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear what you say about that. So okay. So um, feel free to chime in. I have an open seat here. Feel free to join in the conversation. I have a, a list of. Uh, tools that I use. I have some tools that I've run into uh, from people on various blabs. So, you know, feel free to chime in as we talk about these. You know, there's lots of different cloud-based tools. And I am, like I said at the beginning of the show, I am by no means the end-all be-all expert on cloud-based tools. I only know that there are lots of tools that I use, lots of tools I use to support my work. And I wanted to bring those uh, to the table today and talk about those, but I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say as well. Um, comment in there. I had a client with uh, a ransom virus and it encrypted all their Dropbox and Google Drive folders as well. 
wow. Okay. My world's a little different. I ran some virus. Is that exactly what it sounds like? They had to pay something to somebody else to get that unlocked? Uh, uh, that's what I'm asking, Stacy. Is that a, a ransom virus? Dropbox allowed for, yeah, okay. Yep. $1,000 in Bitcoin. Wow. All right. Okay, so that scares me a little bit, but that doesn't really, it's not going to really change. It scares me for the moment, but I'm not going to change the way I work. That is crazy. Oh, yeah. Did I say it wrong? It's slash Q. What did I say? Q slash? Oops. Um, yeah, safety wise, I use cloud drives, but I encrypt my own. Okay, that's cool. How do you do that, Carl? How do you encrypt your own? You use like uh, there's Keycrypt, a couple different softwares. I've lost all my data from hell or backups. I've not yet lost any data from the web. Yeah, me neither. So yeah, that's a good point. You know, data backup is huge. I still have NAS. I have a big Drobo here at the house. And uh, when when it, uh, one of my future shows, we're going to be talking about hardware tools for digital artists. And my Drobo is on that list. Um, but yeah, I haven't I haven't lost anything at the cloud on the cloud either. Um, I have uh, I have Dropbox. I have Amazon Cloud. I don't use Amazon Cloud at all. Um, and our company has their own internal cloud. So uh, yeah, I'd be interested. So yeah, feel free to chime in, Carl. I'm I'm gonna. Uh, uh, oh, there we go. Password lock file folders. Uh, let's hold on. Let me back out of this here. Password lock is the file folder for sending. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. That's cool. You know, security. Uh, I will. I'm free. To, uh, I will freely admit that um, I I trust in my passwords probably more than I do, uh, more than I should, and uh, I, I hope I have good passwords. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not going to tell you my password, but um, that is, there's a. I use a. I do have a. Um, in my uber paranoid world, I have a, a software. I think it's called Keycrypt, and uh, I have to look it up. And I do. You can encrypt a file. And it's like, you know, 168 bit encryption. So last pass. Okay. Yep. There you go. Cool. So some of the other cloud based tools, you know, I use cloud tools for social. I use cloud tools for production. You know, I'm in a, I'm in a, uh, uh, I'm in the animation industry and we, you know, um, the company I work for, we, we make production oriented cloud tools. Um, this, I'm not going to do a commercial for them, but we'll, we'll mention a couple names later. Um, Digital content creation or DCC tools, there's a lot of those tools that are now um, starting to appear in the cloud. And I, I say that because digital content creation, at least from my perspective, means a little more hardcore tools, little tools, you know, on the scale of Photoshop or uh, Premiere or After Effects or 3ds Max or Maya or Blender or Cinema 4D, tools that are normally associated with workstation class, um, digital content creation, not so much the canvas and pixlers and and things like that. Um, I love tools. Yeah, I know, right? I love tools too. It's you know, it's crazy. Um, the only thing I love probably more than software tools are my cameras, but that's a totally different that's a totally different conversation. Hey Tim, welcome CGI collector. Welcome. I'm um, glad to see some CGI people. So, um, so the DCC tools, you know, so um, some of the other tools I use are productivity tools tools that enable my daily work, but I couldn't, you know, I, I consider myself an art, a 3D artist and, you know, multimedia guy, but I, there's a lot of other tools that I have to be very proficient on. And that's kind of the, the spirit of this blog, you know, or of this podcast um, is, you know, where your inner artist meets your inner geek. And, and, and so I'm just showing what I know on that, but productivity tools and then utility tools. Uh, it's a very short list on that, but I have a, a one or two things there. And then, of course, development tools. And I am not a developer. I'm not a coder. I'm not even going to pretend uh, that I am. I know enough code to recognize it to occasionally get me into trouble. But um, that's it. So let's talk about some of uh, the digital content creation tools, some of the more high-end tools, and then we'll, we'll work through the conversation on that. Um, so, you know, I've, I've mentioned the Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, love it or hate it, it's it's uh, here to stay. I know artists that are going to stay on CS6 uh, until you know you pry uh, the pixels from their cold dead hands. I mean, they're just not going to give any more money to Adobe, whether they believe it or not. I can see very legitimate reasons for larger production companies not 
being on rental models um, because their pipelines are locked, right? You have big companies that are doing like movie studios and video game companies that are working on shows or games sometimes a year or two years at a time. And they want very controlled environments. They don't want to be constantly getting an update from wherever it is that they're going to get that update from, right? So uh, they don't they don't do that. Uh, have I ever used Art Rage? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and uh, answer that question. So, uh, have you ever used Art Rage? Yes, I have, and I love it. Um, Art Rage uh, that's a, that's a downloadable, so um, uh, it's not. I don't consider it cloud based. But I really love Art Rage for doodling and sketching, especially if you have a tablet. I have a couple different types of tablets. I have a Companion and um, a Cintiq, and we'll talk about those in the hardware show. But um, I love Art Rage. Uh, uh, Sketchbook Pro uh, is another one of those. There's several different um, mobile-based tools that do that. The thing I like about Art Rage is it really mimics the uh, canvas and the and and paint. Um, it's one of the best ones that I've seen. It's very affordable. I think it's like 50 bucks or something like that. Uh, and it is, believe it or not, one of my go-to tools. Uh, I really en enjoy it. I get as, that's as close to the painting experience that I've, that I've been able to find. I know Corel has similar things like that. Um, I haven't played with, with Corel at all. So, um, anyway, so, uh, you know, back to the cloud tools a little bit. And feel free to keep those questions coming. I have no problem at all answering off-topic questions, so feel free to feel free to to keep them coming. Um, so uh, you know, Adobe CC, like I said, I know people that are going to stay on CS6 or whatever. We're seeing a couple of other things that are happening. Um, the democratization of technology, uh, and Blab is actually a pretty good example of that. I jokingly said, you know, I've only been on Blab a couple of a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks now maybe longer. I don't know. And um, I've been hanging out with Russ and Marion so long. It seems like I've known you guys almost a year, but I, it's probably not even a month yet. That's crazy. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, there's the democratization of these tools. I, I jokingly said that Blab makes everybody a DJ because everybody wants to get the cool mic and all this other stuff and, and, do, and do shows. But um, these tools are getting out to everybody. And you uh, can do more in you know the, the type of things that they're doing here on Blab with four video streams of people all over the world communicating, you know, as maybe as little as five years ago, required a quarter million dollar TV truck, a satellite hookup, you know, you know, million dollar switchers, and a team of about twenty people to make that happen. And now we're happening. Now it's happening in our coffee shops and in our basements and all this other stuff. So cloud-based tools, as long as you have an internet connection. Is are, are bringing these major, major uh, tools right to your desktop that normally people wouldn't have had five years ago. And um, you know, once you're on Blab, you're never off Blab. That's there's a bit of sad truth to that. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, like um, Tinkercad is a good example, right? Um, uh, and again, full disclosure, I, I, I work for Autodesk and Tinkercad is an Autodesk product, so I'm not necessarily trying to push you to that, but I am using it as an example. Um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Autodesk tonight. This is this is just just me. This is These are just my opinions. But um, you know, a good example is Tinkercad, all right? Autodesk bought Tinkercad from the from a competition. You know, they, Autodesk makes AutoCAD. And um, there's Tinkercad out there, which was a competitor, right? And you know, you buy a competitor. Normally, you think, well, maybe you put, maybe you squash it and get rid of it. Well, they turn it around and turn it into a cloud tool and made it available for free, right? So, um, the democratization of uh, a lot of these tools are coming out. Clara IO is a perfect example of a 3D tool. You know, um, if you if you go to Clara.io and check it out, it's a fully functional 3D package. Um, I haven't taken it through all the paces, so I can't speak to, to the level of complexity that it's there. But from what I've been what I've been looking at it, it seems like it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty um, usable. Russ asks, do you see a lot of changes taking place in the cloud based on um, in the cloud based designs, the way the interaction takes place? I've used a few online tools for music, Blend IO, as an example. I haven't used Blend IO, but I'll check it out. But you're I think what you're asking is 
do these cloud tools affect the design process? Um, meaning if the artist was using, uh, uh, is that artists working together? Okay. Um, well, sure. It certainly encourages that. I mean, when you have artists working together, again, if you feel, you know, feel free, if anybody wants to jump in and, and join this part of the conversation, I'm, I'm happy to happy to have you uh, in the show tonight. Um, you know, I think that, um, artists working together is a good thing. And I think that, um, you know, we see this a lot in the video game industry where you have indie game teams that are very remote and they're working on individual pieces of the pie that all come together at the end. And there's kind of this, you know, uh, wizard who's got, you know, the little blue hat on and is, is making sure all the parts are, are coming in uh, at the right time and going into the right place and doing that. Um, I, I, I don't, maybe the, I don't know if that's answering your question specifically, but what your what your question made me think of, and I'd be interested in the room and, and what and what you guys have to say about this, is that um, there's Russ. <clears throat> I'm getting to my question. Hey, Russ, how's it going? Up, oh, I can't hear you. Are you there? All right. Uh, well, he gets that sorted out. Um, my question is. Do you think, like, I, I, I'm not trying to pick on Canva. I really love Canva. It does a lot very quickly. Do you think that Canva is ruining the design experience for the new designer who is learning how to design? And is that, so I, for me, I've been, I, I'm, I'm not a graphic designer, but I'm an animator and I've, I've been through some art, obviously been, you know, in, in the creative business for a long time. And I see these, uh, I see, I can really appreciate what Canva is doing because it makes it a lot easier and I can still make intelligent creative decisions on what I'm seeing. Maybe the first thing I do at Canva is strip down the graphics and say, okay, that's a good inspiration, but this is what I really want versus, um, is Canva or things like Canva ruining the design education experience for people that are newer to the industry? All right, no, no, no problem, Russ. If you want to pop out and pop back in, you, you know, you're welcome anytime. And also, we have another open seat here, folks. Um, feel free to to hit me up with your questions. I'd be definitely interested in hearing um, uh, your comments on whether you think um, cloud-based tools like Canva or uh, and I might even call them templated based workflows, right? So a lot of these cloud tools have templates. Everything's a template these days. Are we limited? Is our creativity limited by these templates? Are we looking for something that appeals to us? And then we're just basically trying to interpret it uh, to what our clients think? Or are we actually able to take these templated tools that we're seeing in the cloud and make creative decisions based on that? So Madison Technologies, welcome to the show. Uh, glad you're here. Um, again, feel free to pop your questions in. We're talking about um, cloud-based tools for artists tonight. And um, use slash Q uh, to join in the conversation. And we're going to welcome in RJ. Hi, RJ. Hello. How are Hello, you? Can how you are you? I like your white headphones. Oh, thank you. Uh, I find them slimming. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a good tool to use. Uh, right, exactly. I really liked your question earlier about uh, is Canva ruining the design school, basically, experience for uh, all of those people out there who kind of not just, to, you know, slapping together a header, but who maybe want to really get uh, the experience. Um, and right. I think that I see it as... You know, it used to be kind of the line was the software, uh, this, you know, Photoshop. It is so difficult that unless you really want to be a designer, you're not going to make it through that whole experience. You know, people, uh, it's just, it's a throw up your hands experience. And and, uh, and so that was kind of the, the part where it kind of we, you know, people uh, who didn't really, really want to, to do the project or, you know, become designers. And now uh, what Canva has done is that it's break it's breaking down that barrier. But I think that there's kind of a new one further down the line. So I think it's letting more people into the design world. Uh, but then further down the line, you know, there there comes a time when your tastes, when your choices need to be more discerning. And I right. don't think that Canva is really ever going to teach people that. 
I don't, right. you know, that's not, that's just not where you go to learn that kind of stuff. So how do you, how do you take people's education then to the next level? That's a great question. Oh, those and are just, I I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, those are just the questions that are rolling around in my brain when you ask that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. And I teach um, at the collegiate level. I, I'm an adjunct faculty member for the um, university here in Asheville, and um, I teach basically intro uh, new media design 101. Right. And the first thing, one of the first things I tell them is that Canva is not a design tool. Canva is an options tool. Right. And you. What's the difference? I'm sorry. Uh, what so? What is the difference between the two? Well, the difference is that the you know Canva is doing a lot of the thinking up front for you. And my, this is all my opinion. I mean, um, you know, feel free to to contradict or whatever. Uh, um, I you know I tell my students I, I want you to design when when we're doing typography specifically, right? You know, I want them to be making type decisions based on what. It, what the, you know, I want them to think about what it is that they're doing. I want them to think about um, the, the message of the type, the, the impact, the reaction that people are going to have to the type. Um, when I go to Canva, I love everything I see there. And as a designer, I know that they've just made that to be appealing. It doesn't mean that it's bad design. It's just meant to, you know, p people are going to like it and then want to put their message in it. So... Um, the, the person, a graphic, when, if I'm teaching graphic design and I, I don't mind if they go and look at Canva, but I don't want them to be going to Canva and saying that's good design when they don't, they don't have the, the visual language to, uh, to really understand what it is that they're seeing. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. Uh, no, that, to that totally, that totally makes sense. So is what you do then as an adjunct faculty member teaching class, is it, is it you that helps them put that into language for the first time? Well, I help them explore it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not, um, uh, I don't want to tell them, you know, I'm trying to think it's a little bit hard to articulate. Uh, you know, we, we, exp I mean, I tell them the mechanics of type and I tell them, I show, I, I try to show them some of the visual language of type. And um, how other people are using, you know, there's very utilitarian type like on, you know, speed limit signs or there's very aesthetic or artistic type of things that we see in, you know, magazines or on Times Square or things like that. And then there's graphic design that's strictly typography and, and doing things like that. So I try to expose them to all, kind, all, all different types of use of type. Um, and. I don't really, you know, and then once they get a little of that under their belt and they go to Canva, they're like, oh, okay, I can see, you know, how some of those things are, are plowing together. So um, the, uh, Russ says the difference between speaking a language versus reading a translation book. Okay. Yeah, I could, uh, I could see that. I could see that. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the typography experience, I know we're kind of getting hung up on type, typography a, a little bit here with Canva, but um, I just keeping it, you know, kind of simple, these tools are suddenly available and everybody's making option, you know, they're, they're presented with these, with these options and selections and for digital artists um, who, you know, we're making our own stuff, um, I just think that it, it kind of impedes the creative process a little bit. That's all. Yeah, I can I can definitely see uh, where that that might be coming in. I, as you were talking, I also I I just I don't know. My brain has ideas all the time, and I was just thinking, wouldn't that be wouldn't that be an excellent online class then? What, what? you know, Canva Plus the the not just the options. But explaining why those options are important and sure, yeah. taking that yeah. language you do with your in-person class, but creating a whole s n series of classes around, you know, making your because you know you've got a, a plenty of people on Canva that are just lapping header together and making it happen, and and that's wonderful. I, I support those people yeah, too, sure. uh, but. <laughs> Then to, you know, I don't know, make a series of online classes or something, just really 
helping people, helping that those options to to not be a barrier, helping people learn. Because I, you know, yeah. it just used to be with Photoshop and yeah. so steep at the beginning. Now, what yes. all of these things, these tools have done is they've made the learning curve uh, more of a more of a staircase, more yes. of a here's a step, here's a step, here's a step. I actually, I and I do agree with that. I think that um, you know it has made. Uh, the ability for us to create stuff like that a lot easier. And I admit I use Canva because it's easier than Photoshop. Yeah. Right. You know, um, and I'm able to, to bring my knowledge to the table and get Canva to do what I want to do. I just, um, and I'm not trying to beat up on Canva. I think it's great. Um, I'm just trying to say that, you know, f the question that I had posed to the room was, does it disrupt education of design is that a cloud tool that is disrupting the education of, of proper design so um you know uh i think there's there's pluses and, and minuses uh to to it as well um what other types of uh cloud tools do you use rj well uh i use well i use the uh the pixlr uh i use that uh i also use acorn a little bit. Uh, I'm a Mac person. Um, okay, so I, I don't know really anything about that. Acorn is like the $30 version of Photoshop. It okay. gives it gives a regular person most tools that they would use. Uh, of course, the advanced filters and effects and all the di all the amazing things you do with Photoshop you probably couldn't do in Acorn. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, process stuff uh, stuff. Uh, you know, run a script on a on a certain photo, all of that kind of stuff. You can't do that in Acorn, but uh, it really has a lot of of kind of nice features, and that's where I go when I need to do something a little bit more advanced than what I'm doing in Canva. There are some things Canva won't do, such as if you need to have any text below a certain, I think it's eight points. Uh, you know, if you're if you're doing something small or whatever, yeah. I mean, there's things that it won't do. So sure. I, I go to my advanced form of software for for at least the the image creation. Uh, I tend to do a lot. Um, I, I, I tend to do a lot of quick and dirty stuff on my phone, actually. Uh, really? And so, cool. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm just uh, every time I'm on my phone, my 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 wife's like. like um, um, are you taking a picture of me right now? And be, uh, you know, she knows uh, when I'm trying to sneak some photos in, but, uh, I do a lot of stuff on, on my phone. And then that stuff is, you know, this, this stuff is stored in the cloud. Uh, but that's, I think a little bit different scenario than what you're talking about. Right. The cloud. I think that, uh, uh, and I wanted to say this before, uh, but the name, the cloud, I think that that is the most unfortunate name it sort of gave the cloud a bad rap immediately because a cloud is something that you can see from far off, but it's very nebulous and it's something you can't touch. I think that that's what makes people afraid. You were talking a little bit before about, hey, your credit card information is already there, you know? Right. And so, but people are people are afraid to store their pictures there, right. you know? Like, okay, so uh, so what's the, you know, uh, what's the difference there? Um, the di difference is just, uh, I, I think that it's it's gotten a bad rap. It's just a terrible name for it. If we would have given it a better name, I think that would have been a better deal. But uh, but yeah, uh, end of comment uh, there. I don't want to take you off in a, in a funny direction, but no, no, no. That's totally no. That's I, I mean, I asked like what like um, I was talking about productivity tool. We, we've been talking about digital content tools. I mentioned production tools like Shotgun and Frame.io. We didn't really go over that. I'm going to try to avoid social tools because I, I kind of want to keep it towards artists. Um, what sort of productivity, cloud-based productivity tools do you use? Um, you know, I use things like, you know, obviously Skype and Dropbox, but um, I use a thing called Real-Time Board um, for, it's a virtual whiteboard. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it is, uh, do you remember Prezi? Did anybody in the room ever... It's like Prezi is like this, like this limitless, almost like vector type of board. Well, well, real time board is that metaphor. It's like, you know, you, you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in or zoom out and zoom out. And it's the metaphor is a, a whiteboard. So you can have sticky notes up there. They have a bunch of templates already that you can pull from to start organizing your stuff. And it's shareable. 
so you can invite collaborators in and they can see your changes as you're making stuff. Like if you're dragging a post-it note from one column to another, they can see that they can be adding the, all of their own post-it notes all at the same time. So, um, you know, real time board is, is one thing that I use. Um, what other types of, of productivity tools do you use that might be cloud-based? I guess it doesn't have to be cloud-based, but you know, that's, you know, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Uh, well, one of the ones that I'm uh, that I use uh, actually is a calendaring tool, tool, which I'm afraid is going to go away soon because Microsoft bought it, and you know what they do—they like to cannibalize right. their products. But I use Sunrise.am uh, for a calendar. It okay. is super cool. Uh, propo I propose meeting times all the time through it. It, it, uh, it really, it really kind of adds. Just as I'm, you know, I come from an artistic background, and I kind of need that. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of really great functions, including that, uh, the meet function, uh, use that all the time, use Dropbox all the time. A lot wow. of times too, uh, I teach a class up at the university as well. And we use, we use Google Docs, uh, during classes a lot of times. So, oh, uh, right. yeah, yeah. So I'll good. ask a question and I'll be like, okay, okay write your name and you know write where and then you know yeah. and so people communicate through those a lot we do that on just docs and presentations uh the i can't remember what the presentations are called but you know what i mean uh yeah, so yeah. things that i use i i try to use i try to stay with the simple stuff but i'm really interested in checking out that whiteboard tool yeah real it's called real time board real -time. right hey lance welcome to the show hey how you doing great so uh, what's on your mind tonight? We're talking about cloud-based tools for artists. So do you have any cloud tools that uh, for productivity or digital content creation that you, that you use frequently? I have a feeling that there's a, a community of people in the world who are a little bit like me that just download every single thing that's ever developed, try it out, and take it off. So yeah, okay. I, I, mess, I mess with everything. But um, excuse me for one second. It's just like a jet outside. I mess with everything, but the reason I chimed in here was there is one program that every single day that I wake up, I wish was developed better and more um, on more better integrations, and that's Google Tasks. Google Tasks, okay. And the reason I say it is because there's a gazillion really robust task programs, task managers that do a thousand things. Like Wonder right. List and you know whatever you can, there are thousands of them and they're all good. Um, Any do and all that, but the Google Tasks, it just seems like Google has this endless supply of money that they can map the world and make cars to drive themselves. There's one one part of their suite that all they need to do is is make it a little bit more robust, and it would be amazing because it's on everything. I don't want to go to another cloud-based service for my tasks. I like personally, I like right. to keep everything in, in Google, and that's the one. What it, thing that so look, let me ask you the inverse: what is it? What is the one thing that it's missing? That third parties in the way that they'll sync to Calendar, the way that they'll sync to con Google Contacts, like constant sync back and forth in the, in the cloud, back in the background, that right. they don't do it to Google Tasks. Mm -hmm. So you take any any number of of what you might have been talking about before I joined insert you know third party app here api right and it'll do calendar and it'll do contacts and it'll it'll completely sync but the tasks are just very few of them i'm an android user and so i use a program called uh, g tasks which is which is good but other smaller companies that make products are just so much more robust than the google product but they're limited because, you know, I can't use them on my Mac. If I open up my Mac and if I go to a hotel and I want to go ahead and just jump on a terminal and, you know, you know how it goes. Right. So I like, I yeah. like the simplicity of everything together. And uh, that's, that's one of the things that I, I wish was, was better. Yeah. I'm trying to think, you know, you bring up a good point. Multi-platform support. That's one of the advantages of cloud, right? Is that if they do it right. You can be on an Android device. You can be on a Windows device or a Mac device. I have, you know, I have Mac and Windows here uh, at the house, and I use both um, interchangeably. I don't do a whole lot of 3D on the Mac, um, primarily because, well, that's a different story. I won't go there. But um, 
you know, the 3D is about the only thing I don't do on on the Mac. I'll, I, I can do I can do virtually every everything else on the Mac, and a lot of that is because of cloud based tools. Um, my Photoshop experience is essentially the same now on my Mac and my PC. Um, you know, virtually any other type of uh, the tool that I use, uh, all of my Dropbox stuff is there. Real time board is exactly the same. Um, you know, I'm looking through my list here. Uh, you know, virtually everything everything that I use is essentially is essentially the same. I haven't found. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, and I haven't started. I haven't really used it a whole lot. I've noticed Dropbox is integrating a lot more with the OS. I see little Dropbox icons on a lot of a lot of the stuff. I haven't really clicked it. Um, I am not on Windows 10 yet either, so I'm interested to see uh, how they're how they're doing that, uh, how they're integrating there. One other tool that I wanted to mention um, that um, RJ that you uh, reminded me of is that was on my list originally, and, and that's a tool called Jing. Um, have have you heard of Jing? I, I we use it in um, I use it in education. I use it in software development. I use it. Uh, I beta test for a lot of different um, pieces of software. Jing. If you haven't heard about it, if you go to um, TechSmith, T E C H S M I T H, TechSmith, um, or I think you can just Google Jing, J I N G. I've used it. Yeah, Jing is awesome. I mean, it it's a screen grab tool and it's a video capture tool, but it automatically uploads to uh, the Screencast Cloud and copies a link to your clipboard, and then you pop that in an email and and you're done. I mean, you don't have to. And as long as your expectations are managed, that you know you're not doing polished video production, you're not doing um, polished graphics production, you're communicating with a picture. I mean, it has simple annotation. It has simple, uh, you know, audio. The audio, frankly, sucks on their video stuff. But if I'm trying to show a, an artist or one of the developers that I'm working with a problem that I'm having with the software, uh, I can just jing it and go, you know, go check it out. So jing is another another a big one that I use, at least for in the visual world. Um, and I've used it in the classroom as well, where I would have um, students... Um, I created a quote unquote classroom account. So everybody had the same login, everybody had the same Jing and I would go have them do their assignments, Jing your research and the research is then shared to everybody. So um, I think there's better tools than that, but for, for that type of application, but Jing is, uh, I use Jing all the time for, for cloud stuff. Um, what other types of, uh, um, we've been talking about productivity tools. Again, if people in the room, um, we're, uh, going on, we have about, um, uh, another 10 minutes or so left in the recorded portion. We're going to stay around and, and keep talking for a while, but if you have questions in the chat room, um, uh, please feel free to use slash Q so I can get them in the question queue and we can highlight those for the rest of the group. Um, uh, and, uh, Guru of Geek got a question by me. I'm just catching it in the feed. If you only have five minutes to create something for a blog, can't, yeah, can yeah, that's totally right. And I think RJ alluded to that. Canva is a nice tool, and I, I think you know, you know, professionals, you know, uh, I think if you have professionals that need something quick, I think it's perfect. So yeah, I, I have no problem um, with with Canva doing that. I was just kind of asking a more uh, thought provoking question, anyways, and and uh, you know. Um, uh, so, RJ and I had a good conversation ab about that. So, um, are there any other tools like Canva, by the way? Well, you I all mean, are you all are graphical. You're graphical people. That's I mean, obviously, if you're talking about Photoshop and all that, yeah, mainly, other, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's other. Yeah, what about you, Lance? What 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 type of stuff do you do? Well, um, basically marketing. I'm a realtor investor. I was a chiropractor for a lot of years. Did a lot of my own marketing that way, but. I got I to gotta say, I mean, for the lay person who's not going to dig into layers and not be professional, Canva is, is off the chain. The design I, and UI yeah. and fun. I find myself going to Canva just for fun. I mean, just to... Oh, good. Yeah, right. It's, yeah, it's really pretty. It's really I, I, yeah, I, I totally... I, yeah, I'm totally with you there. I have, again, I, I didn't want to beat up on Canva too, too much because I really do... I agree with you 100%. And and I think you're a good example of um a per of the target market, one some of the target market of Canva, you know. I think that um there's, you know, there are design purists who are going to never use Canva because they want everything to come out of their brain. 
but uh, you know, I'm a creative professional and there are days when I just got to get some shit done. Totally. And <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, I'm going to use Canva cause I know, you know, now at least I can go in there and I can say, okay, well, so why'd you pick this typeface and why'd you, at least I can kind of back that up a little bit, but it doesn't matter. Right. If, if you're getting the desired result, um, more power to you. And along those lines, and um, I'd love to hear what the room has to say about this, um, uh, Wix for websites. Has anybody ever tried Wix for websites? Yeah, you bet. I have uh, built several websites on Wix now. Um, and and the, there, there is one way that that platform outshines. Think, and there are some, some that are kind of popping up now that are starting to kind of be competitors to that. Wix allows you complete freedom to drag yeah. and drop anywhere you want, put any photo you want behind. I mean, uh, it is it is a complete evolution in thinking design wise, and I yes. absolutely love it. Uh, there's uh, an, a website I designed for a convention that I help with. It's called Takan Getty Monster. And if you click on it, you know, the menu pages, you know, usually they're in a line across the top. Well, if you click on a meatball, uh, those are my, you know, my headers for my menu. And uh, it really creatively, uh, outstanding and awesome. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of things like you know, SEO wise, it ain't that good. Um, so make sure SEO is not necessarily something you're focusing on. Um, uh, and other thing is it has a, the ability to, uh, to, you can kind of create your own mobile design as well, mm -hmm. but when you do something on the, the page, you also have to check it in the mobile and make sure it's okay and redesign if it's not. Yeah. There are other, uh, website creation programs that will do that for you, such as Squarespace. I design more stuff on now, but uh, but if I need complete freedom, if I need a blank canvas and let's throw some paint at the wall and see what sticks, I go with Wix every time. Now I, I have to ask a question: Are you a are you a paying customer? I, I'm not yet. I love I for, I love Wix for all the reasons you said. I haven't I haven't signed up yet, but I'm seriously thinking about it. And this is not commercial for them. I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm totally, uh, the websites that I have made, uh, I've made them for a couple of nonprofits and one for-profit and, sure. uh, they're, they're, they're paying the, and it's not, it's not all that much more expensive than just, you know, getting hosting and throwing the WordPress on there. Sure. Uh, but it's so much more effective. Here's the deal. Here's the difference. Um, most of the time, like my client clientele, very, very small businesses under five employees, right. Or sure. non and so uh, what I want to do is I want to leave them the keys so they can own changes for press for years. Uh, and I right. sit with people and train them and, okay, this is how you replace pictures. This is how you do a blog. Or actually got done. Uh, but I leave people with a Wix and changes get made and things get updated. Right. Because it's like, I mean, so, so ease of use factor, artistic factor, yay for Wix. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Carl's asking in the room, uh, quick one, anyone have any cloud onion skin type collaboration programs? Uh, Carl, can you explain that a little bit more? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, are you talking onion skin in the animation term? Or uh, what are you talking about there a little bit? Uh, I haven't heard that one. Yeah, onion skinning for animation. No, I haven't. Um, onion skinning is um, in animation terms is uh, a, a term from traditional animation where you get a ghosted image of the frames before and after when you're doing traditional animation so you can see how your how your movement is working at any given time in the in the animation cycle i haven't heard of anything like that um multi-user drawing um is that the same are you talking about the same thing no have you i'd love to see that I should probably I should probably know about that. <laughs> Given my job as an animation specialist, but um, I'm not afraid to say what I if I don't know because there's always something to learn, right? So, uh, anyways, um, so you're for those of you that have uh, just joined, we have Rush Miller. Thanks for uh, joining. We still have some other people in the room. We have an open seat if you want to join in. It's straight up eleven o'clock. This is the Creative Tech Show. My name is Chris Murray. We're talking about cloud-based tools for creating content. 
Um, we've been doing the rundown of all different types of tools, productivity tools, uh, digital content creation tools, production tools. Um, I haven't really gone to social yet because uh, the social tools, I see those all day long on um, on Blab here. And I don't, you know, there's a million other social tools. If you want to talk about them, we can talk about them. Um, one other utility uh, cloud-based tool, and I, I put utility as, um, I have pro productivity tools listed as things that I use regularly on a regular basis to, and a long-term basis to support work. There's other cloud-based tools that I call utility tools that I go to for a one-off thing that I, I might need something. One of those is called Paloton. Um, I don't know if you, is anybody, paloton.com. Let me go ahead and, and grab the link. Um, this is a, uh, it's for doing web, um, web colors. Um, and, but I use, I actually, uh, there it is right there. Um, thanks guru. I'm glad you were here tonight. Um, yeah, I would love to have you back. Thanks for coming. Be sure to subscribe to the show or, uh, um, subscribe to me and, and, uh, I'll, I'm going to do these every Tuesday and Thursday. We will talk about something different here on the show. Um, but Palaton, um, and I'm assuming I'm saying that the right way, um, it's you get web colors. But the thing I really love about this tool is I can develop color schemes. And um, I can, uh, you know, do triads or quad, you know, quad, um, tetrads and I can, you know, adjust them, and I can, I can make better color decisions with this tool. Um, it doesn't do a couple of things that I wish it would do. Like I would, um, you know, like to be able to save out the palette, but I, you know, I'll have it open with Photoshop, and I'll copy the palettes over. Um, and you know, I haven't tried it with it with the new Adobe Sync. I don't know if if that would actually work or not, but. Um, I love it for doing uh, color work, color scheme work, and, and coming up with stuff. Um, you know, just uh, uh, to help do my color management right. Because I always get it. You know, my weakness is is I work in a world of wireframes, and I'm not always paying attention to color. So um, you know, that type of thing. It's really a web tool, but I use it for something for something totally different. Are there any other utility tools, either Lance, uh, yeah. that you use? Yeah, um, well, it's not it's not graphical. I, I was about to say one, but actually, I would like to take. Uh, I would actually like to ask you guys a question, if you don't mind, because I don't get to. Oh no! Fire away! Yeah, it's a little bit off topic, and I can wait till the recording part is done. Is it has to do with cloud tools? It has to do with Photoshop. A Photoshop technical question. Go yes. ahead. Why yes, not? No. We're all we're we're all friends. It's just the internet. Go ahead. Okay. So, um. There was a post the other day for Halloween of a man and a woman dressed as Hitler and Anne Frank. And okay, so he's wearing a Hitler costume and she's wearing an Anne Frank costume. It's in bad taste. And there, the woman is carrying a bag and it says mom, of, like mom Frank, and it's a bag of ashes. Now oh, that's horrible. Well, of course it's horrible, but to me, I look at things, what I think, a little bit deeper than most do. And, um, you know, it was basically an ADL type of post. And um, I, took a I took issue with it because to me, it looks like the bag is Photoshop, where it says Mom Frank. It looks like Photoshop letters, and it looks like the bag is almost hanging off her finger. And obviously, it's a sensitive topic. And I took, and I, you know, I brought it up. And I said, look, I go, yeah, wearing a Hitler costume and an Anne Frank costume is in bad taste. Everyone knows that. But to me, it looks like to me. So I would like to post a link to this picture, if you don't mind. If you could just take a look and tell me what you think of the text. Well, you know what? I, I'm going to, I actually, I'm going to ask you not to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I Feel free to message me after the show and I'll be happy okay, to no give problem. my opinion on like that. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I, you know, I, I'm trying to, I'd like to, um, uh, it's a legitimate question. I don't. I'm not. I don't want to. Not trying to censor your question on that, but uh, you know, I'm trying to keep trying to keep it within the within guardrails here. So feel free okay. to uh, message me on that, and I'll be happy to give you my private opinion on that. Um, no, but, uh, I, no problem. Uh, yeah, I, I understand. But, uh, yeah, but uh, you know, it's you know, questions like that are are uh, are generally you know uh, that's a legitimate question to see how they do stuff like that. I mean, the th you know, and that's. The kind of circling it back to the cloud conversation a little bit that earlier in the conversation, I said that the democratization of all of these tools puts these really powerful image editing tools in the hands of a lot of people. 
Oh yeah. Right. And, and not everybody has sound judgment. <laughs> well, you know, well, my and, point is, and, right. Yeah. My, RJ. Mm, my point is the audience, the audience that was seeing this, I mean, I'm not a graphic designer, but the audience that was seeing it has much less technical skill than myself. I know when I see those pictures of sure. people protesting and it's fake writing on the poster, I can see that immediately where other people will post it and say, look what these people are doing. You know yeah. what I mean? Yep. And that's right. And that's what I saw. Well, And it's so trying I'm to elicit. That. It's try, Maybe it's trying to elicit a, a response. I mean, we, we see that all the time with memes and, you know, I mean... You can never hardly believe anything you see, you know, I mean, how many in the past year, how many uh, journalists have been brought down for doctoring, you know, stories and may, well, maybe not, maybe not a ton for doctoring photos, but it happens, you know, you get, I think the AP got slapped or I don't, I, well, I don't, excuse me, I don't want to name names because I don't know for sure. So I'm going to take that back, but I can, so I can remember a couple of news organizations you know, kind of having to walk back a couple of stories because the photos were shopped a little bit. And um, so, you know, and the fact that we now have the term in our, in our vernacular of shopping it, is that shopped? Yeah, right. You know, exactly. it's, it, it's in our so, lexicon. So let me, let me ask you another legitimate question here. And sure. um, so here's my thing as a marketer and somebody in sales, I like to keep track of my emails, my text messages, everything in one place. Sure. And I know there's a ton of programs that do that. I personally like con um, Contactually. I don't know if you're familiar with that particular I've heard program. of that. I, uh, I haven't actually used that. Okay. Even, the Google, even the Google Contacts, the new version of the Google Contacts, will actually, if you go to a contact, it'll actually list anything that's in the Google Cloud that has anything to do with that particular email. It'll go ahead and list it down. So... I personally on my telephone have an SMS backup uh, program where it, it ties together with that person's particular Gmail account or email account, whatever it is, and it'll Con throw up SMS messages as emails. Anyway, contextually, all right. That, yeah, I'm checking it out right now. Contextually. Yeah, yeah. The point is this it used to be able to, and that it used to be able to aggregate Facebook messages as well. And it seems like they pulled the plug on Facebook of being able to track Facebook messages in that and any other program. So I am desperately looking for a program where if I put in John Smith, it will show me under John Smith and I'll pay any price to see my text messages, my emails and my Facebook messages to John Smith. If that exists, do tell. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's got that in the room, you know, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of data mining right there. Um, yeah. has anybody used visually, um, that visually kind of reminds me of maybe some of, of a Canva esque, uh, type of uh, graphic tool there. Um, I know they do videos and infographics. They do a lot of different things, but it seems like they, they share a lot of similarities with, uh, with, uh, Canva, um, so sort of, you know, that, that sort of stuff. What? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Canva's just the UI on Canva is just like it's mm -hmm. delicious to watch. I mean, it's just beautiful. Everything about it, just the animations, the sure. the you know the the frame reset, everything about using that particular website is even. I I love Blab. I think these guys got it right from day one and yeah. how the whole experience is just cohesive. As far as as far as layperson like artistic programs, I've been in PicMonkey. I've been in the online tools and. Canva just smokes everything. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, okay. So I'm going to, um, it's uh, about 10 after. I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap up the recorded per uh, version, recorded portion of this show. We're going to hang out a little bit after I, I switch things off. But I wanted to thank everybody for stopping by tonight. You've been watching the Creative Tech Show, um, talking about cloud based tools for creating content. My name is Chris Murray. And you can follow me at uh, Creative Tech Guy. Uh, you can see there. I'm currently transitioning over from my personal branding of at Chris M. Murray. So, um, you know, there's uh, I've literally relaunched that whole aspect of uh, my social brand recently. So I'm currently rebuilding all of that. But if you go to that uh, Twitter handle and look at the profile, you'll be able to find my original one and see that I've actually been on Twitter more than five days. So I want to thank everybody for uh, stopping by tonight. We've had a lot of good interactions, a lot of good questions. 
Um, we're going to be hanging around for a little bit on the after show. But for right now, I just want to thank everyone and have a great evening.